Welcome. In this tutorial, we're going to look at how we can use some nodes to add some lighting effects, some tone to our characters to make them a little bit more interesting so the artwork isn't so flat. So a couple things that we need to do is when we have our finished character group and then we have situated a composite outside of our character group, if we're done with the character, we need to effectively flatten it. And we do that by making sure that our composite is set to bitmap. If it's set at pass through, we get some odd effects when we're working with the doing compositing. So once you're kind of at that point where you're set, your character is done, and you're ready to start blending it into the scene, we change the composite. Now we generally will have our interior composites all set to pass through so they all blend unless the nodes we're using require otherwise. But when we start doing our compositing in our scene we need to set it at bitmap and you'll notice the shape does change. So when I am as a pass through the bit, our composite has the angled corners on it and when we are set as bitmap it is now just a standard rectangle shaped node. So that's going to be important. So we're going to look at two methods here that we can use that add in effects. And the first one that we're going to use is the matte blur. So I'll add in a matte blur. We're going to need a cutter. And we're also going to need a blending node. So we might as well just grab all the nodes that we're going to need right away so we can see how this is going to come together. So we're going to use these three nodes. So the first thing we'll do is we can connect the matte blur to our character and then we stick an additional copy of that out. Now, we don't see a lot when we're doing compositing inside our OpenGL view. We need to switch into the render view and when we do that we'll notice that our character view has changed quite considerably. So now it's white. So we have a couple of options while we are working inside Matte Blur. Um, first off, we can add in a Blur Factor. So we might choose something like 20 and we can see how now that blurs. It does kind of create a nice little glow, which is interesting. Um, when we're doing lighting, we're often going to want to use a directional effect, which again, that's actually kind of fun too, the way it creates that directional. We don't have to leave our color as white, so we could choose a color. So maybe I want to choose a warmer color for my light, so I'll choose that off of my color menu there. So we can see that, I mean, all of these things right now, now the wings look like this because it's applying it to a transparent color. The wings do have a transparent fill color on them. They're not opaque like the other character colors. So in case you're wondering why those look different where the rest of the character looks the same. Now, one thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to invert that mat. Now, when we do that, you'll notice the background is filled the edge of the character is getting this kind of nice rim lighting on it, which is kind of cool. I mean, if we don't want direction, we just want kind of glow at the edges, we can see how that glow is going in. If we're doing that, we generally are going to use a smaller number here. And we'll see how, you know, it creates that glow, that rim coloring all along the edges. But right now I'm going to go with directional just because I like how that looks. So we have to invert the mat. Now once we invert the mat, we can see how now it's filling the background. We don't want it to fill the background. Well, we know that we are able to cut it using, well, a cutter node. So what I can do is insert my cutter node into this. So I hold down Alt and drag it into there. And we want to cut that. Now, you'll notice when I did the cut, Right now, it is being cut regular. We need to invert it. And of course, I can just check the box here. It turns to white. If I just double click on the little mask icon, it changes it. So now we see, you know, I don't have a background. If we go back here, notice we see nothing. 
It's one of the things about doing compositing, we often don't see anything. Disadvantage when doing this is if I take my scene and extend my scene out, my character was only one frame long, but I'll extend it out. If we have animation, it doesn't play. So we have to just click to the frame and wait for the frame to render. If I go here, we can see how that rendering is happening. It's going pretty quick because we don't have a lot going on yet. But if you had a full scene, multiple characters, etc. Now we can see with that direction, we are getting some interesting things where layers do start to overlap the way it's hitting along that it's hitting the hand, but not the arm. So, I mean, those are things where you do sometimes need to maybe go in and reduce down how much it's affecting. So we tone it down and then that looks a little bit more convincing. I'm going to leave it high though for a moment because we want to do something else. So we're cutting it, that's good, but we can make this a little bit softer and more interesting by adding in a blending node. Now the blending node allows us to change how this group is going to blend with the items below it. And we change it by going into our blending mode. We'll see it's just like if you're used to working in Photoshop where we have our different blending modes. And when we're blending lighting effects, we usually use something like overlay as the most common option. So now when we look here, you can see how, don't want to zoom in that far, but it's creating a much more subtle effect. And the good part about this is if I go and animate something here on my scene. The lighting stays with it. It affects other parts of it. Now, of course, you know, that hip isn't designed for that particular movement there. So we would have to adjust things. But if we move this arm, we'll see how the lighting changes. Now we're catching a little bit of light along the edge there. If we go up and choose the head and animate the head it adjusts how that lighting works. So it is a dynamic lighting that we have. We can see how it's affecting on the wings. So we're able to do some pretty cool things with this. So this is a really quick and easy way that we can apply lighting on it. If you have just one single flat drawing layer, it's going to then just affect the edges of it. So it's affecting each thing. The more complex a character rig is, you will sometimes get weird artifacting happening. And this method, if you have textured fills, so if you have image fills going on and it's not just colors, so if you're not just using colors, but you actually have texture fills going on, then you are going to run into some problems where this does not render properly. So then this would not be the compositing technique you would want to use in that situation. Now we're going to look at a different method of working with lighting. So I'm going to just undo that connection there. We'll reduce out that cable and we're going to look at a different way using apply peg transformation. Now when I choose apply peg transformation, we'll see there's also an apply image transformation. Apply image transformation has a very similar effect, but if anything runs off of the frame, so if you've adjusted something where you've changed, because what it does is it makes a duplicate of your existing layer and or item that you're transforming, but if it runs into the edge, it will clip it where a peg one doesn't. So generally we always use the apply peg transformation for most of the things that we're doing. So the way that it works, if I just go and drop a copy of that in, and now if we put a peg on this, so now if this has a peg, and we generally, it does have two peg ports, but if we just use the outside peg port with it, then that will work. So to make sure I'm selecting the right thing, so when I click here that I'm not you know, choosing the wrong item, I do click just on the peg. And if I were to, oh, no, gotta get my cursor into the right window. So you can see it's just making a duplicate of my artwork. So we could even take a duplicate of the artwork. And if I did have another blending node here, 
And if this was sitting on top, and then if we go into our blending node, we could even, you know, just do something fun like multiply. So, I mean, so you can see it's effectively making a second copy that we can then position differently. That's what apply peg transformation does. But what we're going to do is we're going to combine apply peg transformation with highlight. Actually, I'm going to just get rid of that peg so then we can do it. Uh, properly, we're going to combine it with uh, highlight and with tone. So let's go grab those nodes here. So I choose highlight, tone. Uh, we're going to need another apply peg transformation because the, both the highlight and the tone are going to need those. So the first thing that we can do is we are going to just take and put the highlight in to our main line here and it does need to be highlight when we look at highlight we can choose the color we can choose how much radial directional etc so it, it does have a blurring factor in there that's what the radius is blur type radial or directional we'll leave it as radial for now because for this that seems to work a little bit better than directional. So we do have our highlight there. We're going to have our tone will be beneath it so now that's part of it. But what we need to do is we now need to take a copy of our image here and we are going to use that and apply a transformation on it. Now I want to put a peg on it so I can move it. And let's see if we go here. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, so when we have highlight and tone going on, we get some really, um, it gives some awkward views when we're in the OpenGL view, but when we're in the rendered view now, you'll notice how it got lighter when we applied that transformation to it. But we are going to use an inverted mat on it. Now let's go on to this peg here. And I am going to shift my location of it. And you can see right away how I moved it over and down 10 pixels holding down shift and using the arrow key. Now if we go back into the view here, we'll see that we effectively have kind of two versions. So it gives us this kind of highlight effect, but it's so ugly to look at when we're in that OpenGL view, which is why we always do our lighting and compositing effects after we've completed our animation. So that gives us the highlight. So we're putting our two copies and shifting it over the good part though when we do this is if I animate uh, let me just undo that let me make sure I'm selecting the peg I don't have peg selection mode going on which is why the arm didn't move from the right place but we can see how that highlight so it's really adding some nice volumetric qualities to my character where I don't have to go and hand paint a highlight shape and keep roto effectively rotoscoping it from frame to frame to frame. Now, tone works in the same way. Uh, tone, again, will be an inverted mat. We're going to apply a peg transformation and I need to feed the tone peg from my, or uh, feed my apply peg transformation the information from my main character. Now we'll add in another peg here. And this time, instead of moving, because my right is light is coming from the right, so I moved my highlight down and left. Now for the tone peg, I'm going to go in the opposite direction. So I'll hold down shift and I'll go over one, up one, maybe even do two, so we can better see kind of how. So we now have both highlight, regular color, or I mean tone, regular color, and highlight occurring on our character. And I don't have to hand paint these. So as my character is going to animate here, 
I will be able to you know, see how those highlights and tones are affecting it. It adds some volumetric quality to my character and it makes it interesting to look at. So we have kind of two methods that we can work with here. So notice we're, they're all using inverted cutters. Now let's get rid of that blending, we don't need that. This blending I'm just gonna open up and remind us that we are using overlay on it. And on the matte blur, we have it set up where we have to invert the matte to make it work. So those are a couple things. These, we don't really need to change anything. You can go and change, you know, your highlight color or, to, you know, tonality of it. The tone, you know, the, the hue, you can change the hue in your tone as well. So it does, if we go into it, you know, it has some effect, but it doesn't work great. Uh, the matte blur coloring does give you a richer coloring, but it does have some issues when we're trying to work with textured fills. If we're just using flat colors all generated in harmony, the matte blur cutter and overlay blending is probably going to be the fastest and easiest way to do it. The nice part is, of course, you can always you know, group these together and you can store them as a template. You can just drag them out and add them to any project, any character, stick them under a comp, and you are good to go. So good luck and have fun animating.